All right. So first is first, Dan. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks. Um, I'm at home in London, and we've just had a week of rehearsals um, with with Todd and Murph getting ready for next year's touring, or we hope, you know, hope hopeful touring, depending on the events and the rules that get brought in and out. But yeah, we're um, it was it's been really good um, after two years of not really been able to get together and. Uh, play music in the same room it's been so nice to actually just yeah you know play with your friends <laughs> like sure. the reason the reason everyone starts a band you know just to like hang out and make music and play and um so it's yeah it's been really good very good for the soul yeah before we get uh, deeply into this because um one thing i've heard from a lot of artists is, is when you're in a band and especially when you're in a successful band it, it becomes part of your identity. I mean, it's it's pr probably inevitable. So when that, or at least part of that is taken away, what, was that difficult for you to to kind of uh, get some grounding in a way when uh, being home as much? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty mad. Like you kind of, um, I don't know if it's, it's I, I know what you mean. I, I don't know if it's so much the, um, like, being in a band and therefore having that kind of like oh you're that guy in the band you know that kind of attention for me it's not really that it was more the um definitely playing live you know having the adrenaline rush of playing gigs that was kind of hard to to not have um which was in itself was probably an important lesson you know mentally for me to try and like to to learn and to go through um to be like right I shouldn't need to rely on, you know, this mad adrenaline rush uh, to feel happy or to feel okay. And I think just having, you know, you have lots of ups and lots of downs when you're on tour in a band and, um, you know, from day to day, from the highs of the show to the morning. or um, And so this kind of extreme lifestyle, it definitely, like when you're suddenly like this, you know, through the pandemic, it was hard to deal with. Um, not gonna lie um but saying that um you know having music there to be able to write and record and um like have i suppose in a way it's almost like having a little therapist sat in your head that you know when you're making songs you're trying to well depends on what you're writing about but um i personally and us as a band it's very kind of um sort of trying to make sense of your thoughts and feelings. And obviously during the pandemic, there were lots of new thoughts and feelings happening. Um, so it was a very kind of creative period, um, which funnily enough, after when things opened up in April, personally, I barely haven't, I haven't really felt the need to, because it was so intense for so long. I really haven't kind of been trying to really write any songs or music or anything, but it's just been like, you know, wow <laughs> somehow got got through that um but um <laughs> no it is it's a it's a it, it is a funny one um because everyone's identity gets so wrapped up in whatever they do their day-to-day -day life so whether you're a i don't know a, a lawyer or a teacher or a whatever if suddenly that gets kind of taken away from you for many months it's like all right who am i <laughs> Well, before we turned on the uh, camera, we were talking a little bit about spending, uh, how to spend time during a lockdown. And, and was there one thing that you did outside of music to, to kind of, uh, yeah, get, even, maybe as simple as get a new hobby or what, how did you get through it? Yeah, so I, I tried my best to, to stick to um, a kind of routine as much as possible okay. um, because it was, there was quite a few strict lockdowns where you couldn't even go outside for more than one hour a day. Um, and during those ones, it was very much like, uh, yeah, apart from music, I would go for a, a walk around the park with my girlfriend and we would do pretty much the same loop. And we had, we, we, um, she's never really like thrown a, a ball, you know, like playing catch. And so I was, I missed, like, I love playing tennis and football. And, you know, I was like, Oh, just, I've got no one to like, I can't, you know, you couldn't meet anyone. And so I said, oh, you know, Mary Lou, can you, um, can we, can we go and throw the ball in the park or kick a ball? And she was like, oh, 
I've never, I'm, I'm crap at football. Well, go on, let's try and throw a ball, but I can't really catch. And I was like, I'm going to teach you. So we started throwing a ball and she got really good. I was teaching her, you know, if it's over your head, like the basket and like into your chair. She got so good. We And then we every day we'd try and beat our record. And we got up to 220 without dropping the ball. And it was funny because every day we'd be like, oh, come on, we're going to beat, our, you know, going to beat our record. So that was one stupid thing we did, um, which lasted for a good couple of months. Um, <laughs> apart from that, I was doing yoga um, most days, um, or three to four times a week, probably. Um, and so I, I had the the local yoga place did, um, you know, online less uh, lessons like classes. Mm -hmm. So I just do them. Um, and I'd also, you know, on YouTube and stuff, you can find kind of like yoga with weights and like all these things. Cause right. as you said as well, you know, trying to stay as active as possible is so good for your mental health and for your body when there's so much being indoors, like stationary stuff going on. Um, so that was really important. And then cooking, lots of cooking. Uh, I baked a few things that I'd never tried to bake before, like everyone. Some really nice um, rhubarb and ginger cookies. Um, Sounds delicious. Yeah, yeah some, a few other things. And just tried a few recipes I had never done before. And I drank a lot of red wine. <laughs> well, yeah you gotta keep yourself busy right um, <laughs> what i find interesting then on uh in the music side is I, I believe you started writing the album in 2019 before everything happened and then the whole pandemic uh happens you guys are separated all in different countries and then you you kind of start to flesh out the album i suppose or start to create the album and, and record bits and pieces mm -hmm. of it how tricky was that not being able to be in the same room together not being able to even even as we are conversing right now it's still different than being in the same room so oh, of course yeah um yeah it was uh so yeah we did we did like three two-week writing sessions in in 2019 and we got a lot of songs written um of those songs we made there was like six that ended up on the album And then the other one, we did some Zoom sessions where we did some writing with Zoom during lockdown. Um, and yeah, there's there's probably like two or three of them that we will release at some point, but they didn't feel they didn't feel right for the album, you know, sonically and all that. It just it wasn't quite right. Um, and one of them's going to be on an EP. Actually, we're going to do later in the next year. But anyway, that's something else. Um, but yeah, so the fortunately we had. A, t a good template because when we make our demos you know we really do kind of go into a lot of the details and not usually anyway nine out of ten songs things don't change too much from the initial demo that we make and then we co-produce most of the stuff us like with the producers so we have quite a solid idea of what we're going to do so we knew that we you know if we couldn't be in the same room as each other we knew we'd be able to achieve and because we had a good template For, you know blueprint for each song we kind of knew we'd be able to do it we really didn't want to do that but then as you know the plan was to record in like october november uh, last year and then obviously out of the summer things were looking okay and we were mm -hmm. thinking well let's just book the time in london and hope for the best and then obviously everything went to shit and We went back into lockdown and Murph couldn't come over. Tor just managed to get over before the lockdown in November um, over here. And so, yeah, we we just made made the most of it. And there were loads of, um, you know, I think in, in anything you do in life, you've got to just make the most of the situation. You know, humans are really good at doing that, I think, like you know we're quite resilient little fuckers aren't we um sure and so you know we were just like right come on let's be organized how do we how do we do this so fortunately we had a really great like mark uh the producer for most of the album he's really organized and um you know he knows how to do this and um because during the pandemic he'd done quite a lot of like zoom sessions with other artists and stuff so he kind of knew what was going on um, and then his friend in LA went into the studio with Murph every day and it worked out really well. Like I'd go in in the morning, um, record some drums, 
for the part of the day, Todd would put some bass down on it and then we would send the drums and the bass over to LA so that when they woke up, uh, Murph would hear it and go like, oh, cool, right? I'll put my guitars on top and piano, whatever, um, and then send it back. And then we'd be like, oh, that's cool. But maybe now we need to change the tone of the bass a little bit, or maybe, oh, actually, I'll add some piano here. or And we'd just kind of bounce off each other. Um, and at first, we tried to do it a song a day, you know, or a song every two days or whatever. And very quickly, it got quite chaotic because um, I would maybe be like, well, actually, this sound on the drums will be perfect for this other song. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just record it now whilst I'm warmed up and ready to go? And so we'd record that. But then Murph would do the same thing on a different song. He'd be like, oh, this sound, this could be really cool for that song. So let's do that. And so it started getting like really confusing and like, oh, shit, right, hang on. So uh, we just had to stay really organized and you know, try and keep a list and make notes on where we were up to with each song. And by the end of it, our producer, Mark, he was he was like, you know, I'm going a little bit crazy here, guys. Um, because obviously you get excited in the studio and you're like, oh, can I record some BVs here? I just, I, I've got an idea. And he'd be like, um, hang on, I'm just trying... I'm just putting this all together from yesterday. I mean, um, so it was, but yeah, we, we've worked with Mark um, on the last two albums as well. And we have a really good work, working relationship. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, it, it had a few negatives, but it also had some positives. Um, one of which actually, you know, sometimes you have, um, you know, Beach Boys or whatever would record one section of a song in one studio or room, mm -hmm. and then they'd move to another room to make the sound different. And, you know, whereas nowadays we usually are in one studio with one room, maybe in a vocal booth or some other kind of room, but in general, it's one room. So this actually, I think sonically worked really well that because Murph was in a different room in a different country and with different instruments that we had access to, you know, there was like a sitar in there and different synthesizers and, you know, things like that, that he experimented with different sounds. And because he was in a different room, his vocals with it, you know, everything gets a little, just tiny differences. But I think across an album, it actually makes for a much richer sounding um, album and it makes it feel new because we recorded the whole fourth album in the same room in London. So I think because Murph was in a different room, it's given it a different uh, sound quality kind of, yeah. Um, so yeah, really, really happy with how it turned out. Um, sure, sure, makes sense. And well, as, as a band, especially after the fourth album and, and the, su the success uh, you've been having up to, up until that point, do you think about those things then for a next album? Uh, uh, when you started this process, do you think, well, we need to change things up a little bit or is that kind of, are those happy accidents almost? <clears throat> um, probably a combination. You know, I think there's some happy accidents, but like um, there was definitely on this album uh, a kind of, right, we want to push ourselves and try you know, new things. And so quite a few of the songs, you know, like Ready for the High was one of the first, well, I think it was the first song made on the album. Um, and it was like, obviously it sort of starts with a grungy kind of riff. And then when it was, when it came to like, you know, we got to the chorus and we were like, okay, everything feels great up to here. Where are we going to go next? It would have been easy to go, well, let's just keep going with the grunge feel. But actually it was kind of like, well, what if we went from straight, you know, like a straight rhythm to a more swung kind of like this kind of thing and maybe go more like Beck or Blur Universal or um, Air or, you know, something that's a bit more dreamy that doesn't quite make sense with what's happened before. And so we started messing around and it was quite hard to get from straight to swung across one bar, but a little tambourine that changes rhythm made somehow worked. And then, yeah, it was kind of from there, then the um, Murph started playing like the brass line on, on a keyboard as a, oh, what about a brass solo? And we were like, we've never had a brass solo before. Let's do it. You know, every time it was like, if we've never done this before, it's getting a thumbs up. So that song, and then once we'd done brass on that song, we wanted, you know, often you have like themes in an album or sounds that come back and visit you again. Then once we had that in our heads, we were like, oh, this could be cool to do on other songs. So like Wildfire, Worry, um, you know, we, we we put some in. We didn't want to put it everywhere, but, 
you know, there were a few moments where it made sense and um, that really helped, yeah, give it a certain colour. And then same with like in Wildfire, like we had the song going and it was a bit like talking heads, David Byrne sort of stuff. And then for the middle eight section, we were like, well, we could have a middle eight that's, you know, with lyrics and stuff, but there's so much has been said already in the verses, like maybe it just wants an instrumental kind of thing. And then Murph just went, what about just going like full on Tron? You know, the <laughs> Tron soundtrack by Daft Punk. He listens to that in his car all the time. He's like, what, do, what about Tron? So we just turned on some arpeggiators and we all started playing like, and it went into this weird world. And then like the arpeggiators carried on into the last bit. And we were like, how the fuck does this work? But somehow it makes sense. You know, it just, it felt right. Um, and so, yeah, we did that for quite a few songs. We, we tried to pull the rug, you know, from underneath the song as much as possible um, at the right moments. And obviously there were some songs that we made that it didn't quite work as, as we were hoping. And so they're not on the album, <laughs> but that's what's really fun, you know, experimenting with like new directions and new ways to take a song. And especially with, um, yeah, like I don't, Poke the Bear as well. You know, you've got this song that's just like grooving along and we could have kept it going, but then it goes to like Scott Walker kind of, 60s sounding stuff and then back and then like queens of the stone age riff at the end you know it's a bit it's probably a bit chaotic but um we wanted to have that like real remarkable like scene change you know like in a in a film or like in cinema like we love the cinematic side of music and the storytelling mm. and the imagery the imagery that you get from it and how much the music can influence the images that you see in your mind and your feelings and having that playing with that a little bit more and pushing it a bit further in, in each direction. The idea was to like, if we're going to go in that direction, let's really go in that direction. You know, let's not just have like a little bit of a, a arpeggiator underneath something else. Let's just go full on like Tron or let's go full on Scott Walker or, you know, whatever it was. Um, we tried to do that a little bit more from this album, I feel. It is great. Uh... That you that you feel the confidence and have the uh, creative freedom to do so, I think that's that's very important for musicians. Uh, but what yeah. you what you mentioned uh, is very interesting as well of of kind of that cinematic quality of music and, and forming Im images in your mind. Because I read somewhere and I, I don't know if this is true, but that Matt has a lot of uh, uh, yeah visual images uh, attached to the songs, like um, method uh, to the madness. He has this. Uh, a thought of Barcelona and, and mm. uh, those kind of things. Is there one song on the record that you have a very distinct kind of picture for? Um, yeah, I think one of mine is um, in uh, Ready for the High in the chorus. Um, it says like, um, I should be thinking moonbeams. <laughs> and like, I just get this image of like someone's head with just moonbeams, like, you know, exploding out of it or something like, um, so like, uh, yeah, you know, surreal visuals like that. I remember we were trying to find the line in that, in that chorus. And, um, it was like, the, and then that, that image was just there in my mind. I was like, oh, I just keep seeing moonbeams and like, what can work with that? And then Murph like put it in and was like, oh yeah. Right. Um, and so like that, those kind of images for me are always like, I just, I love it because it's it's not a usual thing. Um, but also I love the really like everyday real things. So like um, Murph often does this where he puts like a very banal gesture or thing into a song. So like um, in the middle eight of Poke the Bear, it says like, um, uh, leave, leave, the key, leave the keys in, in the plant pot by the door. I don't know if you've listened to that song, but you know, yeah. that, that idea of like, it's such an image of like how many times, you know, people get home from a night out and, you know, when you're younger and your mum or dad or your girlfriend or your, your, your housemate or whatever, you've said, oh, just can you leave the keys out for me? And it's like to have that in a song where all of a sudden visually I, I just feel like I'm like looking under a plant pot to mm -hmm. get the keys and like things like that. There's I mean, and there's lots of them as well. Um, obviously for Murph with, the, with Methods of the Madness, that's like actually kind of loosely based on his honeymoon with with his with his wife now um in barcelona so 
you know, he's obviously got a very vivid imagination about that. Um, I wasn't in Barcelona with them, funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there's, on top of that as well, though, we, we, you know, I always, I feel like there's memories where wherever we made the song or wherever we recorded the song, and then once you start playing it live, you get lots of memories attached to the song from certain venues, you know, so sure. the songs kind of evolve as you go along. Whether you've been involved with them or not, you know, as a music fan of, of whoever, like, you know, if I listen to, <clears throat> I don't know, a Bonnie Iver song that I've listened to, you know, 20 times in lots of different locations, you get lots of those different memories coming back in, don't you, at different times, which... I, just, I love that quality about music. Yeah, it's even smells and kind of things yeah, and smells, in your yeah, life. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. It's, it's probably some some a neurological thing, but it's it's really it's interesting how that works. Isn't it? Well, my um my granny died from uh, dementia uh, mm. like a couple of years ago, and and my granddad had it as well. But funnily, with both of them, um, the last thing to go is music. So like the last thing for her, for my granny was like before she she then stopped speaking altogether. But like she had um, some songs from her childhood. That was the only way to get her to oh, to say anything, and it was music. You know, it's so just it, amazing. It does, yeah, it's fucking powerful. Like what it does to your brain and where it is and where's it stored and how it links so many things. Like it's it's yeah, it's crazy. From your perspective, then, and, and being in a band for, for quite a while now and, and being on the production side of this, because you have people listening to your music, you have people finding something in the music. What, what does that what, what, what does that realization kind of do to you or what is that kind of realization for you? Um, I think every musician really is, is like is looking for some sort of connection and you know, for, for us, like making the music, there's, there's the initial stage where, to be honest, you're not thinking about anyone else apart from the song and the music, you know, and what makes you feel something. So it could be a discovery of a new synth and a new sound or, so, you know, that makes you go like, whoa, it, you know, because it, it's, you say you play music for a reason. It is playtime. It's very like, you, you should, you need to be in that kind of playful mood when you're doing it a lot of the time. And it's just so exciting, the discoveries that you make and that creativity that goes with it. So in in f foremost, that is the kind of, um, you know, that's the the sort of acorn, you know, that's, mm. that, that's, that, that's the important thing before anything else can happen, that, that sort of part of it. And then there's the, the, the therapy side of music that like you feel yourself. And I suppose for me, the, the main thing I hope or what, what touches me the most when fans write to us and, um, you know, say what a song has meant for them or how our music has helped them get through chemotherapy or, yeah. you know, you get lots of people who, or, or they've been really depressed and they couldn't get out of bed, but every morning they listen to our album and then they get out. You know, there's lots of stories we've had from people who've been through really tough times and it just so happens that our music's resonated with them and given them some extra strength or force or, connection to someone out there that kind of feels the same way they do or brings them some energy that we've managed to put onto a recording and and it's translated and I think that's the main job of on the production side is to get it make it so that it translates as well as possible your what you're trying to achieve and what the the feeling needs to be and if you can get that across and people can resonate with that then you know for us everything else is it doesn't really matter. You know, it's all bullshit. Like those moments are like, fuck, that's when music's got, it's like, you realize how powerful it can be and uh, kind of <laughs> life changing or, or, you know, it can really, it can just help you through life, can't it? Um, oh, certainly. So, well, that's um, it. That's yeah. interesting. Is, is there one uh, song or maybe a, an album that you, that you had on repeat during the lockdown or during the past two years? Is there one, one, song or album that that helped you through uh, a, a tough day yeah um yeah the first the, the, the probably a few but the first one that came to mind was um do you know bc camp light no um so there's a song called i'm all right in the world uh check it out after this interview yeah um, i will <laughs> bc bc camp light um i'm all right in the world and 
it's just amazing and it and it came out i think in like march maybe um this year and it was just at the end of like a real shit time you know like winter in the uk plus lockdown after what had happened the year before it was just awful um and this song i listened to it like probably i don't know i heard it on bbc6 like radio like six six music um when i was cooking one day and like you know when you just get that moment of like oh what's this and i don't get that very often to be honest um you know it's normally just like yeah a bit of background you, you know music cool but that just made me go like wow i need to and i listened to what the song was called found it listened to it and i listened to it every day for like <laughs> for, for a month probably you know it was like <laughs> it was one of those songs where it just made me feel like so at ease and calm me and even though it's dark lyrically it kind of has this like I'm all right in the world sentiments and like you know when you get those moments and you're like I think I feel like this guy felt when he made this song you know right um exactly that and it just a bit of com it's like company it gives you company doesn't it like in a weird way it makes you having spent so much time just me and my girlfriend um it, it just it gives you that sense that there's someone else there with you like in a weird way um yeah it's it's, it's very interesting because even though listening to music is almost part of my job now it's it's still i'm surprised how much effect it has on my mood if i'm in a certain mood and listen to a certain song then it can change and it's it's very <laughs> interesting how, how how influential it can be yeah it's so it's so it's so cool um and obviously that's not the same for everyone you know sure. some people music's not that important in their lives or whatever um but i think when you're a music lover it's you know you you, you sound like you you're the same as me like you you <laughs> understand, you get that those moments where like fuck this helps so much yeah and especially uh, you mentioned cinematic music that's that's one thing you know, I, i think of a lot of things i, I as in soundtracks, there's a certain uh, mood attached to it. Because when the uh, lockdown, and one of the albums I listened to a lot was Marvin Gaye's uh, What's Going On and songs like yeah. Inner City Blues because it just felt like, okay, that's the mood right now. And, and I have to yeah. kind of uh, toughen up a little bit and get through this, the, the, the kind of, <laughs> that kind of feeling. Brilliant. Um, with what you mentioned and the, about the world, when did the album title, because I think it's a really interesting, especially in this time, uh, Fix yeah. Yourself, Not the World. Uh, it's very interesting to, to not just shout at the world, trying to, to have everybody bend to your uh, particular needs or whatever, but, but to, to look inward a little bit more. Well, when did this concept uh, arrive? And then do you as a band discuss all these themes that are on the album? Yeah, so um, it was towards the end of the recording process um, and Murph sent an email. He was like, uh, I've been thinking about this for the album title. It feels like it, you know, it makes sense for the for all the songs and like um, all the rest of it. What do you guys reckon? And it took me a while to like, I, I ended up writing a big email back because it, it makes you think of so many things sure. um, and which is what I loved about it. You know, I was like, right. But then I was like, well, obviously thinking about the different nuances within that phrase, I was like, well, so some people could read it and go, well, obviously for things like climate change, inequality and um, human rights, you know, for the big, big things in the world that are major problems, fixing yourself isn't going to, you, you know, does it sure. sound like a selfish thing? So that's one side of it. But then actually in the same email i was like but i think it's a, it's an awesome title and actually obviously in the sense that if you if you're really depressed or really anxious or not happy in your own self trying to help anybody else is just never going to happen you know you can't if your own house is like a fucking mess you can't actually go and like try and tidy someone else's can you and i think that idea of pointing the finger inwards um you know, rather than constantly looking outwards for distractions, because obviously with the pandemic, we all had a lot less distractions in our lives. We couldn't go out to the cinema. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So you, all of a sudden, it, it, I think it's, it was really weird. And like, for me personally, when we started discussing that 
um, the album title, it actually sent me on a little, I didn't even realize, but it sent me on a little path of kind of self-discovery a little bit over the next six months, ju- like during the lockdown and, and, and out of it. It was very much like, I think I've always been as a person very much like gig, gig, festival, go to the cinema, go for a night out, go for a meal, always occupying myself, you know, and, and also I'm kind of not dealing with any problems. Like if I felt depressed, I'd be like, ah, oh, just go out and, you know, stop thinking like this. Never actually like properly dealing with stuff. Um, and so that at the album title actually, um, for me anyway, made me go like, yeah, maybe I, maybe I've been neglecting my own like problems for a bit too long. Um, and so, yeah, it's got some, you know, been getting some therapy and stuff and it's been really helping. And like, I just feel, feel a lot better and a lot calmer in my brain. I mean, I'm still very, I, I'm an overthinker um, and I don't think that's going to stop, but um, you know, it's uh, sleeping better and like, I feel like I've got more energy for other people and other, you know, other things uh, in life that um, maybe sometimes you, when you burn the candle a bit too much at both ends, you're not, you really aren't great. Like in your, you know, in your relationships or whatever, you kind of, maybe you get a bit short of fuse, you know, your temper's not what, you, you know, you have reactions that you're like, why did I, why did I do that? You know? And I think the, the album title, I really, I really hope that it's going to make people have a think about it and not, you know, and I think that's what's, what's great with uh, a lot of Murph's lyrics as well. Um, that when you dig into them, they really do, you know, they make you think a lot of the time, or they, you know, they can make you think if you want, if you don't want to think you can just have a dance and not think about it, you know, <laughs> um, and mosh and mosh the blues away. But um, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, like part of music as well to to you know not that it's it's not you know we're not a political band but like sure. you know just to have to to encourage people to to think about that question with, without really necessarily giving an answer but then we wanted to have the last album on the song is called fix yourself then the world and we kind of wanted the journey to be you know hopefully by the end of the album or in the for Murph in the album or for all of us in the album by the end of it it's like okay this has helped us kind of fix ourselves and now we can go out and be you know good members of society and help our neighbors and be good people and yeah sounds good I have one <laughs> last question yeah and, and, and I have I'm, I'm pretty much the same I'm an overthinker as well and then one thing this album uh, made me think of and it's in a couple of songs is also um to to be more present in the moment as you say sometimes you're kind of feels like you're on autopilot and especially when you have a lot of distractions you forget about a lot of small things so uh yeah, yeah that that's what it reminded me of mostly um I have oh, one so, last... that's so good to hear that's awesome because i haven't spoken to many people who've listened to the album yet apart okay. from us okay so that's that, that's really good to hear well, I have one last question because you mentioned kind of the, the busyness uh, of touring and, and what that does to you. And I have to say that this, this stream will stop in four minutes. I only have four minutes left. So okay. uh, <laughs> just, just as a warning. Um, but, but how are you looking towards now the next year then? Because from January, you're doing some UK shows. Then you're going to the States. Then you're doing some arena shows in the UK. And then uh, mm-hmm. you're doing Europe. So, so that whole... If everything goes to plan, that whole thing, that whole train is, is leaving the station again. Yeah, oh, I can't wait. It's it's been um, yeah, it's been too long since we've done it, and also having a new album. Um, and as I said before, you know, we've been practicing this week, uh, and it's just been so nice to play again. And like, we're all so excited for people to hear the new songs live. Um, and you know, I feel like live for us it always takes the songs up a level to like a higher energy level and like when people are interacting it's like yeah it's it's just so fun and to be honest to see smiling faces like we had three festivals this summer that we managed to do and the feel you know to see just people happy and having a good time and dancing it was like so amazing after the last two years or a year and a half um so hopefully we get to do that and um yeah but and and also i do think doing music helps you stay in the moment quite a bit because you can't be anywhere else 
you know, like it's the most, like the only other thing I found like doing yoga um, or, you know, breathing exercises or whatever, you know, like doing that is you get to the same place mentally as when you're playing a song because you can't think about anything else. You're just in the moment. And, you know, as, as you, you know, as yourself, like I'm an overthinker and it's one moment where the other thoughts in my head, they just slow right down and there's nothing. And it's like, yes, (laughs) peace. (laughs) Yeah. I I don't play uh, basketball anymore, but I used to have that when I played basketball, that all of your thoughts are just focused on what I I have to do in this very moment. Um, the absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your oh. time. Yeah, cheers, mate. You too. All right. Have a good one. See ya.